بكت عيني بكت عيني بكت عيني على ذنبي وما لاقيت من كربي فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ما بعد This last week um, I've been bombarded with so many questions especially of our youth uh, I've had a number of conversations with them about the overturning of Roe versus Wade and even today in my office hours I had you know some youth as well with so many questions so I thought it would be useful to uh, share some Islamic perspectives on this regard so that inshallah ta'ala we can benefit and begin a broader discussion. Obviously only so much can be done in a short khatira. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Roe versus Wade is one of the most landmark and historic Supreme Court rulings in this country. It was passed in 1973. So basically 50 years ago, 49 years ago. And it is considered to be the culmination of the second wave of feminism. So I need to now take a step back and explain what is second wave feminism. So feminism is a movement, as you're aware, these days they consider it to have four stages. The first stage, which began at the turn of the century, uh, was the fight for women to have, the political fight for women to have the right to vote and the right to own property. By and large, that was finished and successful by World War I. So across all Amer European countries, Western countries, women won this right. World War I, World War II kind of halted the feminist movement. Post-World War II, second wave feminism began. Second wave feminism began challenging gender roles and the notion that men and women should have the same opportunities and the same playing field should be level. Up until World War I and II, women's roles was very different career-wise, education-wise. Look at any black and white movie, look at any uh, historical record in the past. Women were, let's say, nurses, and men were, so there was this gender role that was understood. World War I, World War II, because of obviously the socioeconomic factors, men are going to wars, things are changing, so second wave feminism begins. Second wave feminism, women are arguing that why should there be any difference? We can do the same thing as men. And so education-wise, a lot of people don't know this, that up until the late 60s, early 70s, most universities were gender segregated. Harvard and Yale only began admitting women 1970. Unbelievable. This is a generation where many of you might have been studying in college. This is when these universities began admitting 1970, not 18, 1970. So second wave feminism, they wanted a level playing field. Men and women should be the same in this regard. And intimacy wise as well. How come men get to have fun and women cannot get to have the same type of, you know, sexual intimacy? So you had a part of this was the revolution, the, you know, the, the, the hippie movement and the notion of sexual freedom, if you're aware of, you know, that movement as well. In this time frame, one of the rights they wanted, therefore, because the problem comes, okay, education-wise, both can study in the same class, whatnot, but when it comes to intimacy, when it comes to intercourse, one of the genders gets burdened the way the other gender doesn't, Correct? One of the genders is left with something that is not wanted. And the other gender gets to walk away scot-free, right? So in this second wave feminism, they began demanding the right for not just abortion, but also contraception. Again, many of us don't know this. Up until this point in time, it was very difficult for a woman or a man to get contraception. It was only in the 1960s that the government opened this door because they understood or whatever the reason was, they thought it would lead to immorality, which obviously it will. They thought, well, let's keep a control on this. So in the 60s and 70s, contraception became widely available. Before this point in time, you needed a doctor's prescription, believe it or not. And it was very embarrassing and a woman had to go. It was very awkward. And women also began demanding the right of, of what? Abortion. Why? Because freedom now, no baggage left. Whatever happens, okay, now it's fair. Because before this point in time, if the man does something and leaves, who's going to get, you know, quote-unquote, stuck with the child? So the right of abortion 
became a hallmark of the second wave feminism, so much so it was considered and it is considered to be the victory of second wave feminism. This is the culmination of women's rights of the second wave. And third wave begins after Roe versus Wade in the late 70s, early 80s, and that's a different wave where women are demanding representation. Wherever there's men, there should also be women. And women are demanding equal pay. And again, I'm just speaking factually over here. As for my own views and whatnot, I've given a khutbah about gender in Islam. And we firmly believe that genders do have meaning and genders do have a role. That's given in a khutbah, right? Now I'm being factual here. So third wave feminism, then fourth wave feminism. We're interested in second wave. So Roe versus Wade was passed at the culmination of the second wave feminist movement. And it was viewed to be the biggest victory for feminism. 49 years remains unchallenged. It was passed by a vote of 7 to 2. What is Roe versus Wade? It is the court ruling that the governments, the constitution of this country guarantees the right of a woman to have an abortion. So the federal government, along with the guarantee of no police can you know, take your property without a warrant, they cannot serve, all of this guarantee, freedom of speech. So this, the Roe versus Wade said, of the guarantees of the Constitution is that a woman has a right for abortion. What that court case did, because it's federal, Supreme Court, all 50 states of the country have to allow it, because that's the Supreme Court. And government funding is now applicable because it's the Supreme Court. As you're all aware, America is a conglomerate of states. States and, and federal, they always have an awkward relationship together. But when the federal government and the federal court, the Supreme Court passed it, all states have to come on board. And so it becomes a constitutional right. As we're aware, many people challenge this. And uh, last week, uh, by a vote of six to four, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Now, what does it mean to overturn Roe versus Wade? A lot of people don't understand this, right? Their argument does not ban abortion. A lot of people miss the point. Their argument is actually very simple and straightforward. It's very simple. Their argument is the founding fathers of this country and the constitution they drafted has nothing to do with abortion. They didn't imagine the founding fathers about abortion. And it is a mistake to link abortion to the Constitution. This is all they're saying. They are delinking the constitutional guarantee. And they are saying the government, based on the Constitution, has no right to get involved. Hence, it goes back to what now? The states. A lot of people are misunderstanding that this ruling is banning abortion. No, it's literally withdrawing federal support, agreed. But it has no effect on any ban, but effectively, obviously, immediately, as you know, 15 states, whatever, they went into ban locally in their states. But the government, the federal government, is not getting involved. They're saying that it was a mistake, by the way, Roe versus Wade was passed, I think, seven to two. The two dissenting, uh, the two dissenting uh, Supreme Court justices, that's exactly what they argued. That's exactly what they said. Whatever your position might be, it's not a part of the Constitution. You're reading it in. Those two dissenting voices now becomes the majority, six out of four. And they're saying the same thing, okay? Now, this is the history of uh, Roe versus Wade. Now, a lot of Muslims immediately get bogged down in the fiqh of abortions. As for the fiqh of terminating pregnancies, I've given a whole hour Q&A with Dr. Hatim Al-Hajj, uh, one of the senior scholars of North America and a medical doctor. One of the few people who's combined knowledge of medicine and a PhD in Islamic fiqh. I have an interview with him here in Epic Masjid. Uh, during uh, COVID, we had a, a Zoom interview. You can listen to that. And it's a very detailed lecture, the fiqh of, preg of terminating pregnancies. You can listen to that. And in a nutshell, there's no question, I have to summarize all of this, there's no question the default in our sharia is that Allah blesses you with a child, you take it as a gift. The default is the preservation of life. And exceptions are exceptions. And our position is definitely not as strict as some evangelicals and Catholics, but it is definitely not as open or liberal as the left is as well. We celebrate life and we affirm that Allah blesses, so we're supposed to maintain that life, but there are exceptions. And definitely in the first you know, month or so, perhaps there's a few more uh, laxities given, but never, never is 
uh, aborting or getting rid of a pregnancy allowed because of an inconvenience, because of monetary factors, because it, 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 of the standard reasons that are given here. Medical issues, no doubt, yes. And that can be even maybe in the second trimester. Medical issues, uh, issues of you know, problems, no doubt. So the Sharia has uh, a, a, a more nuance for you. can listen to it in the lecture over there. And we need to be practical here now. Forget uh, the, the Roe versus Wade. The reality in this country, for the last 10 years, roughly, roughly, one million uh, fetuses were being aborted. Roughly, sometimes more, sometimes less. One million for the last 10 years. Now, whenever uh, Roe versus Wade comes up and, and, and abortion, you always find, generally in the left-wing media, a very uh, emotional story of a lady struggling with a problem or a rape or an incest and wasn't able to be aborted. Actually, if you look at the statistics, now the problem comes statistics, the government did not and does not compile statistics on why abortion occurs. This is private entities and some states, they monitor why. So I did a quick survey today and I'm giving you general numbers. I'm not claiming these are exact, but I did enough to know, inshallah, it's, it's confident to say rough ideas. Generally speaking, abortions that are due to rape and incest are less than 0.5%. Generally speaking, abortions due to rape and incest less than 0.5%. That's one out of 200. Less than that. Abortion due to medical issues very broadly defined. Very broadly. Because when you say medical, what do you mean? Is the mother's life in danger? Uh, is the child going to be born with abnormality? That's a whole big spectrum. Roughly 5 to 8%, depending on which survey I looked at. 5 to 8%. The default of abortions, unmarried uh, uh, mothers who did not want to have a child for financial or it was inconvenient or they didn't have a partner with them. In some surveys and statistics, up to 85% of abortions is because of this statistic. So, when you read one of these sad stories and whatnot, this is the 0.5%. Let's not forget the default. The default, it's inconvenient of an action that should not have occurred. You get what I'm talking about, right? It's the byproduct of something that should not have happened and you're like, uh-oh, now what do I do? And then they go for the abortion. So let's be very clear that those people that are bringing up those exceptional scenarios, we don't base hukum shari on exceptional. We base it on the hukum um, am here. Now, another point that I also want to mention when we talk about this issue of abortion is that subhanAllah, we thank Allah, we thank Allah that our Sharia has come with clear-cut guidelines. Because honestly, it is really a difficult situation or scenario. When does life begin? Who has the right when it's early, middle, late? All of these questions of a philosophical, theological, ethical nature, how would you resolve them if you didn't have revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As for us, did man think that he would be left without a sharia? As for us, Allah says, Your fathers and your sons, you don't know which one of them will benefit you more when it comes to the inheritance and the fractions of inheritance. Allah says, how would you decide the fractions of inheritance between your father and mother, between your son and daughter? How would you decide? How would we decide anything without Sharia? Our morality, our akhlaq, our adab, our halal and haram. If we were to leave this to the chaos of people voting, of the fads that take place amongst people, subhanAllah, one day something will be halal, the next day it will be haram. Doesn't work that way. The halal is what Allah has made halal, the haram is what Allah has made haram. And the Sharia comes and teaches us this reality. That's why Allah says that the Sharia comes to make the pure things halal and the filthy things haram. How would you know pure and filthy unless the Sharia has come? So we need to use this conversation about the gray area of ethics, morality, politics, law to teach our communities and the broader society the blessings of having a divine revelation. When Allah Azza wa reveals in the Quran, when the Prophet says 40 days here, 120 days there, 
alhamdulillah, things clear up. We now have a clear-cut understanding. When is the ruh blown in? Our fuqaha, yes, there's a small spectrum of ikhtilaf, which is always the case, but it is relatively small spectrum. Our fuqaha generally have a very clear idea about the fiqh of terminating pregnancies. We thank Allah for this, because when Allah speaks, the messenger speaks, sami'na wa ata'na. So we don't have to worry about those ethical and philosophical debates that takes place outside here. Now, another point I also wanted to mention is that too many of us, especially our youngsters, are caught up in the rhetoric of the left, in the rhetoric of the progressives of the Democratic Party. And we have to keep this in check. We are neither Democrats nor Republicans. We are neither left nor right. Our language is not the language of the current politics. It is the language of the Sharia, the language of the Quran and Sunnah. We don't base things based upon the fads of today. No, we are above this. We need to teach our children this. And honestly, not just our children and, and, and our community, we need to preach to those around us the reality of why this is taking place. You see, we jump to the problem, to the cure, and we forget the solution. This whole debate that is taking the country by rage about the rights of abortion, abortion. Well, let's take a step back. What's happening before the abortion such that you're thinking about an abortion? This spread of immorality and the normalization of fahisha and the prevalence of the hookup culture, it is something that is, should astonish the average mind. 100 years ago, in this country, less than one out of 10 men and women engaged in premarital intercourse. The norm was you wait, you live a dignified life, and then you get married. This is just 100 years ago. Now, I just looked up the surveys, almost 97% of men and women, some said 98, 99, engage in premarital in the broader society. There is no concept of it being immoral. So you guys, the broader society, is jumping to the problem and you're forgetting the cure. You're forgetting why this problem is happening. This problem is happening because you have lost all morality. You don't have a sense of what is decent and dignified and you have opened the door for fahisha. So we as Muslims need to be very clear about this. It is actually a mistake to jump into the abortion debates without taking the step back and talking about akhlaq and morality. Haya, our Prophet said, every religion has one defining characteristic. And the defining characteristic of our deen is modesty. Haya, haya, modesty. So when you open the door of fahisha, and this leads us to even the ultimate source of opening the door for fahisha, because fahisha is linked with not believing in a higher power, not believing in a day of judgment. If you believe in a higher power, this country was Christian 100 years ago, very Christian. That's why fahisha was very rare, less than one out of 10. Religious levels have gone down. Belief in God is now considered to be antiquated. They don't believe in a hereafter. What's going to happen when you don't have Iman in a higher power? Society is going to go as it has become. So we as Muslims, we have an important role to play. That role is to be beacons of preaching morality and the truth. We have to tell society around us, we are Allah's Delegates, to be honest, where Allah's kuntum khayra ummatin ukhjal din nas, Allah sent us ta'muruna bin ma'rufi wa tanhauna anil munkar. Allah has chosen us to preach the truth and forbid against the evil. We cannot force anybody. That's their business. But we have to preach the truth. We have to speak the truth. We have to live the truth. And eventually the people around us, as they see all of society become corrupt and the evil becomes even more evil and the fahisha becomes even more foolish as it is happening now, when we stand up and preach the truth, Insha'Allah Ta'ala, people with pure hearts, pure fitras will click. They will understand. Yes, these people have a religion from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, conclusion here. It is a mistake to jump into the abortion debate immediately. It's a mistake because the abortion debate is predicated from a culture of fahisha from a culture of promiscuity, from a culture of complete allowance of every haram. We have to go behind this and say, hold on a sec, this should not be normal. And it is not normal because we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we link it even 
beyond this, even to the basics of Iman in Allah Azza wa Jal. And we call people worse than the sin of abortion is the sin of shirk and kufr. Worse than this is the sin of shirk and kufr. So we have to preach people about believing in Allah Azza wa Jal and morality and tawheed. And one final point, my conversations this last week, and this should not be any surprise to you, was very interesting to say the least. I think there is a clear divide between most of our youth and most of our elders in this issue, which is symptomatic of their views on religion and deen and liberalism and feminism. There is a clear divide between college and teenagers versus those that are in their 40s and 50s or maybe even late 30s. So I strongly encourage all of you parents to sit down with your teenage children, not even teenage, maybe even middle school are well aware of what's going on, and open up this conversation. What do you think about this overturning of Roe versus Wade? And begin talking about akhlaq, morality, haya, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Explain to them it's a mistake to jump all the way there without working your way up with iman in Allah, with believing in what is halal and haram, with the reality of what happens when fahisha is opened up. It is not healthy when our community is so divided where the youngsters are pretty much many of them, if you see what's happening, are aligned in one, uh, in one area and the elders are very much disconnected from what's going on and not even communicating with them. So I strongly urge every parent to sit down with your children, to have frank conversations and to bring them back to the basics. What is the basics? We believe in Allah. Allah sent down the Quran with our Prophet to teach us how to live our lives ethically and morally. And when we follow that Sharia, when we follow the Quran and Sunnah, our lives and societies around us will be pure and healthy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to that which He loves. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect our children and grandchildren. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our sons and daughters to be beacons of morality and beacons of akhlaq. Wajazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب